Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Ray Heipel, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. Pastor Mark Motor, Berean Church in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. Pete Jacqueline, Pastor South Hills Assembly Guy Church, Bethel Park, Pennsylvania. J. Anthony Gilbert, Pastor of Another Level in the North Hills. You guys all need to give your zip codes next time or something. <laughs> 15237. <I> mean, <laughs> all right, 15237. There you go. Well, today on Hard Questions, we are talking about evil, we're talking about guidance, and we're talking about fear in our lives. Interesting. Mm. Let's start with this. One viewer wrote in to ask Should Christians put on the armor of God each morning? If so, how do pastors put on the armor of God? Pastor Jay. Don't you got an answer for that too? I do. One <laughs> leg at a time. <laughs> Just like the rest of us, right? Yeah. That's yeah. It. And that's, I mean, really, I don't think it's like pastors are different from us. Maybe pastors may have more of a uh, priority and make sure they need to do it because of the mantle and stuff that they carry, but everybody needs to do it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, in my opinion, putting on the armor of God is your devotional time in the morning. Uh, it's getting your mind right, it's getting into the spirit, uh, it's spending time with prayer, which I fear far too many Christians don't do enough of. Uh, we don't take the time, oh, oh, let, me, let, me go, let me backtrack. Far too many pastors right. don't pray. What is that, what's the statistic class? Five Less minutes. than five minutes a day yeah. mm -hmm. that pastors usually pray? Well, basically you got a sock on, that's about it. The rest of your body's naked, you know, against the enemy, but that little bit of prayer. Uh, and I think we need to get back to that. Um, I tell people every day, and I'm going to talk into the camera for this one, I would love to do a statistic of every church in Pittsburgh and see how many people truly pray. And I'm not talking about the Starbucks prayer when you hop in and you're praying on the way to work while you're driving. I'm talking about where you get up extra early to get alone with God until you're no longer alone with God and then come out with your face shining like the noonday sun knowing where you have been. Now we can be salt and we can be light. Even with solar power, you know, it's all about spending that time in, the, in some type of light and it draws forth the energy from the, that light and then it can operate accordingly. That's how we put on the armor. It's total dependency upon him. It's being in his word, getting our mind in there, getting our marching orders from God, getting filled up with his presence. And now we're decorated with his presence, with his glory, with his anointing to go out there and to make an well, impact. it changes everything for your day, doesn't it? It changes, it changes it's everything. Totally, completely it changes different everything. mark. If someone wants to put on the armor symbolically as a reminder to themselves, I think that's great. But there's really nothing that says that we should take it off once we put it on. Why do we change clothes? Well, we get dirty, we, we sweat, whatever the case might be. We want to change our outfit. But once you put it on, I think you need to keep it on. Now, you still do your daily devotions and so forth. But the other thing, there are those times when you have a crisis or a situation where you may have to grab the sword. But as far as the rest of the armor, I think it's something we need to continue to walk on or walk in every day. Just keep that armor on. I, I know before going out the door, Eli and I will usually hug in the kitchen and uh, we'll pray together. And, and we do exactly what we're saying. We put, uh, I'll say, Father, we put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, loins girded with truth, feet shod with the purple preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the standard of fire, the dart of the enemy. And Father, we take the sword. It's, it's, just, it's our declaration awesome. of that day. And I, and I agree with you, Mark. It's something that we never take off, that we put on that armor, we keep it on. And, but I think there's nothing wrong with declaring. I know we do Absolutely. that on missions trips mm -hmm. in the morning when you have big groups, you lead them in that. But. I have to say, Jay, that was powerful. That was convicting. And I, I totally agree with everything you said that, um, you know, this is something that Christians need to do every day. And yeah. it's because we're in battle every day. You know, the yeah. armor of God mm -hmm. is, armor is put on a soldier uh, in that day. And all of those, uh, the, the whole thing's an analogy and everybody got that. Nobody thinks that we're supposed to buy you know, actual pieces of armor <laughs> and put them on. Um, but it's a reminder, number one, that we're in a war. Right, and every day we wake up, we're in that war. Yeah. Just as you have to get dressed every day, every day you have to get your mind, you know, in tune with God. And you know what you said was so powerful, Jay, that we need to do that, and and that God Himself provides all the armor. Yeah. Right, I mean that's yeah. that's crucial. Right. There's nothing I have. The only thing I can bring to the battlefield of Satan is a target and an easy one at that. <laughs> um, but with God, you know, and and the way in which we do it, as you said, Jay, in the Word, in prayer you know, then I am able to resist him. I am able to resist the evil one who will flee if I do so. 
You know, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, church is vitally important. I mean, we're all, you're all pastors here, but that day-to-day -day is oh. even more important. That day-to-day -day yeah. walk with the Lord. Yeah. Great answers, guys. Well, let's go to the next one. How do you recognize the guidance of the Holy Spirit versus your own will, you know, your own voice? Pastor Mark. Great question. And if we're honest, I think we all deal with that. John 4 says that God is a spirit or the Greek God is spirit. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says the spirit of man is the candle or the lamp of the Lord. So he enlightens us within our spirit. Now our minds can be, God can minister and we can hear some things, but the mind can be uh, listen to the world, the devil, all sorts of things. So what I like to do is spend time in the scripture, spend time in prayer. And as things come, say, Lord, is this just my mind or is this you speaking in my spirit? And I will say this: some people think if it's in your mind, it's wrong. But, you know, God gives us common sense for a reason. We don't throw out common sense unless something goes against the scripture. And there are those times where, where our mind says one thing, but we know in our heart or according to the word, we need to go in a different direction. But the, to me, the big key is get quiet. Say, Lord, show me, is this just mental thinking or are you speaking in my heart? And he'll show us that as we wait on him. And you know, when you said get quiet, Mark, my, my immediate thought is, and the scripture says, you'll hear within you a still small voice yeah. saying, this is the way walk ye in it. And when you hear that still small voice, I also believe that God will always back that up with scripture. Sure. So I think those, those two key components are very important. His, his voice is in stillness and he's not going to be yelling and screaming at you. And then again, he'll confirm it with his word. Yeah. Yeah. So Ray. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I like the phrase guidance of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe in an ongoing revelation. We've, we've all been there and, and done <laughs> I that. I knew we were going to go there. But. <laughs> but I do believe the Holy Spirit is alive and well. Mm -hmm. Every believer has him um, and he does convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And, and he uses the word to do that. And so uh, we do test all things by the word. We do judge by the fruit. Jesus says, you know, many false prophets have gone into the world and, and I can deceive myself and I need to recognize that. So there's wisdom in many counselors. Um, but a lot of this, I think, I, I mean, I'm just sort of reading between the lines, but I think some of this gets to how do I know God's will? People do that all the time. Mm -hmm. well, how do I know what God's will is? And, and, and I think God's will is that you be holy and that you obey him. And apart from that, I don't think, you know, that it is somehow um, your duty to figure out what city to live in or what car to drive. Or, you know, I've heard people say, well, if I feel like I'm supposed to take this exit, how do I know that it's God? You know, that's kind of madness in my opinion. I mean, <laughs> you are free to live the Christian life. God gives you his commandments. Live the Christian life, whether you're a butcher, baker, or candlestick maker, if you're serving Christ, you can glorify him. This getting caught up and I'm gonna miss God's will you're not going to miss God's will because he's sovereign and therefore do what he's told you to do in his law and his commandments and then you know you're obeying him. I'd rather be in the wrong city doing the right thing than be in the right Amen. city doing the wrong thing. <laughs> Pastor Jay, any final thoughts on uh, this? You know, I just think it, you know, like you, I, I like some of the stuff that you're saying. I think we have to be careful that we don't start looking for like, uh, should I get Cocoa Puffs or Rice Krispies? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, we got to be careful of those types of things. But, but I also believe too that, you know, I was at a restaurant one time and I'm ordering food and uh, somebody else, was, I know that voice and they knew me from television. And so obviously they had spent enough time watching me on television to identify my voice. Even if they didn't know who I was, I was facing this direction, they were behind me. They yeah. said that they picked out my voice because they had spent enough time. When you spend time in God's presence, you will pick up on who he is. You'll pick up on his character. But the key, That's you said enough. something that Eddie said, wait. Mm -hmm. You have to wait long enough in prayer to identify him. And I like what you said about Elijah. You know, there was the earthquake, there was the fire, then there was the wind. So a lot of times people try to decipher that and say, is that the Lord, is that what he said? But the Lord wasn't in any of that. Wow. But then, the still small voice. Will we wait through those things before we get to that point? And that's when we find out who well, that, his voice is. That's so good. All this is so good. Obviously, stay in the word of God. And when you hear that voice, recognize that it's usually a different, different sound than your own voice. It's a, don't be telling yourself to do things in your own voice, but uh, trust and uh, rely on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Well, we're going to take a, a quick break. We'll be back in 60 seconds. And then we'll ask, how does God define evil?
Welcome back to Hard Questions. We have a really great question coming up next. Does God and the world define evil differently? Is this not the easiest question <laughs> ev ever that we've ever had? <laughs> Ray, <laughs> take us home Yes, on this. there we go. <laughs> yes, we're done. We're done. <laughs> you know what I like about this question is we all recognize that the world and much of it, the atheistic world that doesn't even acknowledge God and therefore really can't uh, confirm that there is such a thing as good or evil, yet everybody does believe in it. Everybody operates that way. All the climate change people out there protesting, I mean, they think it's evil that you're driving your gas-powered car or, or any of the causes, you know, the PETA people. It's evil that if you drink milk or something because you're making the animals slaves, and they do it because it's evil. I mean, everybody, no matter who they are, because we're moral beings, because we're made in the image of God and we cannot eradicate that, we operate on a good and evil basis. We all do no matter how far somebody rejects God. And so uh, the idea that there is this idea of good and evil in everybody and it's driving them, it's absolutely true. But, you know, what God says and what God shows us is his law. And his law is righteousness. You know, Jesus boiled it down to just two. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is all the law and the prophets. So that's the great summary. And then under that is the Ten Commandments. That's another summary. And then under that, there's like, you know, another 400 and some. I mean, all of the moral law is righteousness. We have a confession in our uh, Reformed Presbyterian Church in the Westminster Confession. And our shorter catechism question uh, number 14 is, what is sin? And the answer is, sin is any want or lack of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. God's law is righteousness and any transgression of God's moral law is evil. And that's what God tells us uh, law is and, and righteousness is. And, that, and that's his character. Again, law isn't something God just makes up. God is saying, this is who I am. Right? I am the God who hates murder. I am the God who, who hates stealing and coveting. So when he reveals righteousness to us, he's revealing who he is. And when we judge according to, to, as he judges, we are saying we love him. To love God is to keep his commandments. And therefore the world, when it does what it wants, it's keeping its commandments, which is against God. And doesn't the scripture also say, Ray, that it's not grievous? For us to do when we... Oh, yes, It's yes. not grievous. It's not, his commandments are not burdensome. Because that's yeah, what we say, right? Yeah, the They're PG, burdensome. Yeah. This yeah. is the love of God, that right. you keep his commandments. First John. Yeah. We know, I also think, too, uh, the world, uh, by far, it's a distinct yes. Because, you know, we, start, we look at evil with degrees. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, we look at different people that are rapists or a pedophile or something like that. Oh, my God, these are horrible things. Mm -hmm. But how many of us can honestly sit here, someone said right now, if you went into Giant Eagle and ate a bite from an apple, would send somebody to hell for that? Mm -hmm. In essence, that's what brought us all into sin. It was just disobeying yeah, yeah, a direct yeah. order. Even, it, that wasn't in quote unquote I what we would look said at. John Eagle brought us all into sin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry no. about that. John no, 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 no. But okay. if you went in there and just took a bite, that's all he did. He yeah. ate yeah. from a tree. I mean, this wasn't like it didn't hurt his wife. Right. He right. just disobeyed a direct order, which goes back to what you said. And so it got, and that was enough. That, think about it, that was enough that Christ had to die for that. That would have been the only sin. That was enough that Christ would have had to die that horrific death because he ate the wrong produce. So, I mean, if you're looking at it from that, does God look at evil differently from the world? Of course, because nobody yes. would probably put somebody in prison because yeah. they ate a uh, giant eagle apple. Right. But God said it's worthy of hell. So we have to, when we look at it from that standpoint, it's completely different, different than the world. Different definitions completely, Mark. What I see is people today, they want to conform God into their image rather than the other way around. But yeah. the scripture says his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, his ways are higher than our ways. And so rather than trying to get God to believe what we believe, we need to say you are truth, your word is, is, is reality, so we're going to conform our lives to what this book says. And that's exactly what we're, we're finding. Like, I worked with a guy years ago that I, I said to him, uh, you know, we were talking about sin, and he goes, oh, yeah, I know I've done things wrong. I brought children into this world, into this horrible world. I know that's a sin. And see, that's not a sin. And, you know, I had to say, well, that's not really a sin, you know, because, again, we're f falling away from the word of God, Pete. In Isaiah chapter 5, and this is the world we live in today, in Isaiah chapter 5, 20 through 21, it says, Woe to those who call evil good. And we're in that day today. Mm -hmm. Today, evil is good and good is evil. Yeah. And who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Mm -hmm. who, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise, there we go, in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. So 
Man is, again, man becomes the center of his world when God, Christ, must become the center of our world. When Christ is no longer a center of our world, then we're, we are calling good, evil, and evil good. That's good, Pete. That's really good. Well, good answers, everyone. Let's go to our next question. It's from the hotline. We love our hotline questions. Let's listen. If you remember your earthly life when you're in heaven, how will, it, how will that be heaven? You will not have remembrance of your earthly life in heaven. If you do, it's no longer heaven, correct? All right. <laughs> All right, well, that's an interesting take. So, Pete, I want you to uh, okay. define this for okay. us a little bit. I really, and I think, Ray, months and months ago, you, you commented on this, um, but I, I I really believe, according to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, I think there'll come a time that God, once we're there, once we're entering into, can I use the word eternity, Revelation 21, 4 says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be shown no more pain for the former things. Here we go. The former things have passed away. And I believe when... And the Bible also says, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. And God knew that if we had a continual remembrance of earth, of loved ones, and those who maybe didn't make heaven, uh, he knew that heaven would no longer be heaven, the joy of the Lord. There'd be no joy because we'd be in constant remorse and, and sorrowfulness. So I believe that, that some way, somehow, like only a, an amazing, infinite God can, when, once he wipes all those tears from our eyes, I don't think we'll remember our sin. I don't think we'll remember everything we did wrong. And I really feel with all of my heart, we won't remember those loved ones who aren't there in heaven with us. Because I think we'll be so caught up with the fullness of God. Well, certainly we'll be caught up into the, the glory yeah. of God at the that wait, point. And that word glory means weightiness. Yeah, right. Um, I think, I think we will remember, Pete. I understand what you're saying. I agree with what you're saying, that we'll be so caught up in the glory and everything else. But I don't think God wipes our minds. I don't think that's true with God. You know, I will remember their sins no more. The Bible uses that word to mean that I'm not going to treat you in accordance with your sin. It doesn't mean that God, who knows all and he's omniscient, can forget anything. God can't and technically forget anything. He chooses not to remember. Yes, he chooses not to treat us that way. And I, I think that's what you meant anyway, that um, I, I think, you know, the judgment is dependent upon our remembering. The rewards, you know, he will reward us for our good works. That's dependent upon our remembering. And I, I think this person must have had a hard life, uh, must have gone through some difficulties. You know, that if, if I remember this life in heaven, somehow heaven's not going to be heaven. And my heart really goes out to, to you, whoever you are. Um, the fact of the matter is, maybe you've had a very difficult life and you've suffered, you know, many things. But, you know, uh, there, what you're going to see in heaven is you're going to see how all of that worked out. Yeah. You're going to see how God used right. all of the pain and all That's of the right. injustice and all of the actual evil that he too hates for his glory and even for your good. And you're going to be able to rejoice. I think <laughs> when we're in heaven, I think if I would see my mom in hell, I will rejoice at that because I will have the mind of Christ. I will know that's exactly where she deserves to be. I will not have any sympathy for evil anymore. I will perfectly delight in righteousness, perfectly uh, hate evil. I will rejoice in all that God has done, including the damning of the wicked. And, and I think that's what I think you're, what you meant, Pete, when you said like, you know, we'll be completely you know, enraptured in the thoughts and in the will of God and we'll see everything as he sees it. It'll all make sense. That's really tough for us to get our minds around though, that whole thought if we see a loved one in hell yeah. that we will rejoice in that. But that is exactly how God is. He sees, he knows everything and yet is still completely joyful. You got to take on yeah, this? Real quick on that part there, I believe that just as we'll be perfected, everything evil will be removed out and everything that is like Christ will be there. If we had loved ones that went to hell, everything that could be redeemable, you won't see your mom down there. Not the mom that held you and rocked you. That, that person's gone. That will all be removed. They will be completely demonic. Nothing redeemable about them. They will become the perfect, fulfilled child of Satan. Mm -hmm. That's what will they'll be. So you'll look, you're not looking down saying, oh, wow, that's mama down there. You ain't going to recognize mama. Everything good in them was from God, and God right. has removed it now. Removed it all. Wow. 
<laughs> okay, interesting question. Very good uh, discussion. We're going to take a quick break, but uh, when we're back in 60 seconds, we're going to take on our hotline question of the week. This week's hotline question is a confusing one for our viewer. Let's take a listen. I'm calling up to ask, who, who is Melchizedek? Who was he? King of righteousness. Thank you. Well, Mark, let's dive in there. Who was Melchizedek? Well, that's found in Genesis 14. Abraham comes back from a victory in battle and meets a king slash priest by the name of Melchizedek. And there are two main thoughts. The first one is that he is actually a pre pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. or he could be a type of Jesus. I personally believe he was not actually Jesus, although Jesus was at times the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. I believe it was a type of Christ. And uh, Hebrews talks a lot about this. And one passage in Hebrews 7.3 says, that Melchizedek was, with, was without father or mother or genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life. And so people say, see, that was Jesus. But then the rest of that says, like the Son of God, or another translation, resembling the Son of God. So my personal perspective is that it was a type of Jesus. I do think it is interesting he offers bread and wine in that passage, which could be a symbol of communion. If someone sees it differently, that's, that's fine. I don't, it's not a heaven or hell issue, but to me, it is a picture of Jesus. And remember what Jesus said. He said, Abraham saw me before Abraham was I am, and he saw me and rejoiced in my day. So I think he saw a picture in this example of Jesus. Later on, he actually saw the Lord in Genesis 18. Okay. Any other thoughts on Melchizedek? I know the uh, ancient Jewish view was that it was Shem, um, the son of Noah, uh, because you know it's about that time and Shem would have been a couple of hundred years old and he would have been a believer in Jerusalem. Uh, I don't s subscribe to that. Um, I, think, uh, I think Mark answered the question well. Uh, many do, especially in my circles, believe it's the pre-incarnate Christ and you know, he doesn't have genealogy, but that could just speak to the fact that in the scripture he doesn't have a genealogy. Mm -hmm. He clearly is a type, uh, a type that Christ fulfills perfectly because he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And all that I think must mean, all that needs to mean, if I could say it that way, is that in the scriptures nobody appoints Melchizedek priest. He just is priest and nobody gives him a genealogy. He just has no genealogy. And li literally that's true of Christ. He is our eternal high priest. He has no genealogy because he is the ancient of days in his divine nature. And so um, I, I think that's the, the real picture. He's the king of righteousness, you know, Malak, Zedek, uh, king of righteousness, but he's also the king of peace. It says king of Salem. And isn't that Jesus? Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. You know, the fact that he's holy and just, he's going to punish sin. And yet we're not consumed because, because of his sacrifice, he's made peace with us and God. And so we have his righteousness and we get his peace. And I think that's the ultimate message of Melchizedek, that Christ is the one who is our righteousness, who is our peace. You know, I just have a, a question to ask you guys. You had mentioned um, a, a, pre a vision or a, a, a pre-incarnate of the pre-incarnate Christ, a Christophany, I think it's called, or a theophany. What, what is that? And where else is that? In, is there another example? I mean, I'm just dropping this on you. Is there another example of that in the Old Testament? I mean, there are several. Oh, uh, yeah. Jacob uh, uh, wrestling with the angel because he calls him the Lord. Mm -hmm. The angel that appears to Samson's parents. Why do you ask my name? Seeing that it is beautiful. Many places where the angel himself is an angel, but then he's worshipped or he is also the Lord. And, not and, like a regular angel that yeah, would not he, accept worship. Because the word angel just means messenger. And so that sometimes God himself in some way appears in a messenger. Uh, and, and then he receives worship. And so, you know, many theologians have said, well, that is a pre-incarnate Christ. That's yeah. Christ before the incarnation appearing to men in the guise of a human being. And I mean, it's certainly a, a legitimate understanding in my opinion. Yeah. Any other, any other points? Any other thoughts here? We good? I'm good. You're good. We'll just yeah. stand right there. Yeah. 
right. Good? Well, we like to end the program with a scripture, and today we go to Psalms, where it says, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. Psalm 10, 17. How does that hit you in 10 seconds there, Pete? You, he will cause his ear to hear. Well, I, I believe that the Lord's voice, uh, someone once said when, when, when we pray, they can just picture, and it has to deal with the mercy of God, that God is always bending over, that God always has an ear to hear his people call, call unto me, and I will answer you. Amen to that. Amen. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program. We really would love to hear from you. You can email your questions. Look, it could be about Melchizedek, it could be about Christophany, whatever. Email your questions, the hard questions at ctvn.org, or you can call our hotline at 412-349-4326, and we'll put you on the, the hotline question. You know, God is listening. God is hearing. God's heart is for you. He is towards you. He is not a God that is far off. He is near, but you need to reach out right now. And when you do that, he's going to respond. He is waiting. He is waiting to hear from you today. So share your prayers with him and wait for his incredible answer.